Hey, hi everyone. Thanks for coming for our pro seminar, our second to last pro seminar of the semester. Um, today we have the honor of having a, a in-person speaker, Dr. Ava Lands from John Hopkins. So she's an assistant professor of anthropology and Africana studies at John Hopkins University. She holds a PhD in historical archaeology and cultural historic, excuse me, cultural heritage preservation from Syracuse University. Yay. Western New York, uh, <laughs> as well as MA in anthropology from NYU. Um, alongside her current position at John Hopkins, Dr. Lands also serves as the site bioarchaeologist for Harlem African Aerial Gravel Memorial and mixed use project in New York City. Uh, her research interests integrate black feminist and critical race theory with bioarchaeological investigations. Dr. Lands Research tracks the long history of violence against Black women in the United States. The contributions of her research are multifarious. On the methodological front, Dr. Land's work links skeletal data with a variety of archival resources to pose qualitative questions concerning the lives of 19th century Black women whose remains and experiences are contained within skeletal and manuscript uh, collections. On the ethical front, Dr. Land's work prompts us to consider the formation and use of museum collections, the objectification of human remains, and the history of race. On the epistemological front, her use of Black feminist theory and the arts compel us to consider the limitations of our discipline's objective stance without necessarily stripping anthropology of its imperial, imperialistic yeah, imperialism or rigor. Her publications um, appear in numerous peer-reviewed publications, such as Feminist Anthropology, Historical Studies in the Natural Sciences, and Curator, the Museum Journal. Moreover, she has also disseminated her research through the general public-facing platforms, such as Sapien Magazines. Not too surprising that Dr. Lands Research and writing has received support from many notable organizations, including the Weta Wren, Ford Foundation, and Smithsonian Institute. Our talk today is entitled Working for Black Ancestors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Angel Lance. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, let's hope that the computer functions. <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to be talking a bit about um, some more recent work I've been doing um, since finishing my dissertation, which focused solely on Black women. Um, I've been expanding outward more focused on the ethics of keeping the remains of members of the African diaspora in general, um, and also how we should go about using the remains of Black ancestors in bioarchaeology and museum studies, if we should be using them at all. Um, there are no pictures of human remains in this, so don't worry. Um, so, is this going to work? Is there a clicker up there? Uh, I'm getting really excited. Okay, so... Um, a lot of my work, uh, it turns out I have to spend an inordinate amount of time explaining Black history to people um, because it is imperative to know the, the history of the treatment of African descended peoples in the United States to understand the arguments I'm making for the treatment of our ancestors in skeletal collections. Um, and this has been an ongoing battle. Uh, my mentor and colleague Rachel Watkins talks about this in her uh, work uh, in particular, an altered native perspective on bioarchaeology, that we spend so much time explaining Black history to people. Um, and if our history was treated like, you know, mainstream history in the United States, this wouldn't have to take up so much space in my research, but it, it does have to. Um, and so just overall, the United States is incredibly racist um, and still is. And a lot of people will be like, oh, slavery was however many hundreds of years ago, but we are still living with the ramifications of slavery. And after slavery came a failed reconstruction, if you will, Jim Crow segregation. And now we are in this era of mass incarceration and the movement for black lives. Um, and so to quote uh, anthropologist Siobhan Scott Lewis, in the United States, the harm caused by 246 years of slavery 
90 years of Jim Crow and racial ter terror and continuing discrimination have resulted in cumulative compounding and cascading consequences affecting all aspects of Black American life. Emancipation did not meaningfully disrupt the terms by which the formerly enslaved existed in courses of ex extraction and exploitation. Um, and the past half century of civil rights has not adequately ceased the collective vulner vulnerability of American Black communities. Um, and to go along with this viewpoint, I draw heavily on the work of historian Diana Ramey Berry, who argues that Black bodies matter. Um, and it has never been our lives that were mattered by society on the whole, but instead our about for our bodies and what they could be used for and how they could be exploited. So in her 2017 work, The Price for Their Pound of uh, Flesh, Diana Ramey Berry considers how the objectification of Black bodies influences the valuation before birth, throughout life, and after death. Um, so she, the reason that I really latched onto her work when I saw it is that she talked about, um, in particular, the use of Black bodies after death for medical, well, before death for medical experimentation and then afterwards for further medical exploration scientific studies that really have not benefited contemporary living Black populations. So for example, if you think of the work of J. Marion Sims, the founder of modern gynecology who perfected his practice on Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka, just three of the enslaved women whose names we know. And yet, if you look at uh, contemporary motherhood mortality and infant mortality statistics for Black descended peoples here in the United States, we were still dying um, at alarming rates. Um, the other thing that I want to point out that I'm not uh, emphasizing so much here, but a lot of my work, I also draw on the work of scholar Catherine McKittrick um, because one of the, the dangers of focusing on black bodies and on this history of, of, of suffering and sort of what Christine Sharp calls living in the wake, um, is that we run the risk of making it seem as though black death and degradation and suffering are legitimate findings. That can just be my conclusion. Um, and what we need to do is, is challenge this assumption and pass that. Um, we need to acknowledge that, you know, black life in the United States is indeed affected by, you know, this history of slavery, by the construct of race, but it's not limited to that. And that's not all there is to black people. Um, so more anthro specific and the reason I, uh, you know, this work spoke to me so much, uh, my undergrad and my master's were both in biological anthropology. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until like partway through my master's, I was like, there's something really wrong with biological anthropology and it's extremely racist. Um, and so looking at the history of the discipline, um, Dr. Michael Blakey has been complaining about Alice Herlichka for decades. No one wanted to listen to him. I was thrilled when that recent hit piece came out about the Smithsonian and his brain collection because I was like, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> but like, I was so excited to see like Twitter, like black Twitter with like Alice Herlichka's picture. Like, yes, what we've been screaming about for decades. So the father of American physical anthropology, if you will, in the United States, and I want to talk about the use of American, not just the United States, but um, Herlichka uh, really, he defined the field as the part of science that occupies itself with the body and its functions, investigating differences, causes, modes of development from man's beginning and among his present multiple group. So as Herlichka is trying to professionalize early physical anthropology at the turn of the century, he is very interested in race science. Um, I mean, he even traces back, you know, how he sees physical, anthrop going, physical anthropology going. He starts with the work of Samuel Morton, Morton's cranial collection. Um, and Morton specifically had that collection to argue for, you know, inferior intelligence of different racially defined groups. So early physical anthropology really is about creating race, and that's how Herlichka envisioned it. Um, the, the other thing is that he would compare uh, anthropology, he said eugenics, so the science of race improvement was applied to anthropology, that's how he saw the science going. Um, and he was very interested in the different types of people, so here I have, you know, just one of the many things he published, physical differences between uh, white and colored children. Uh, he has a lot of things on, on black people and how we're super inferior. Um, he even would say in 1927 on a, um, it was actually a commission in part 
uh, sponsored by the federal government of the United States, he would say that the real problem of the American Negro lies in his brain. It would seem, therefore, that this organ above all others should have received scientific attention. That explains his racial brain collection at the Smithsonian. Um, so really, I've been, I think a lot about if we're tracing the roots of physical anthropology, which of course, me being a bioarchaeologist has roots in physical anthropology and archaeology, to men like Herlichka, who established a field to study and make race real, what does that say about our methods and the way we're doing things? And if they're appropriate to ask the questions that we are now switching for as we switching the new questions that we are focused on, especially in decolonizing um, museum collections and dis disciplines, et cetera, how can we do that if we're still tracing our lineage back to someone like Herlichka? And here I would also like to insert this uh, caveat that, well, not even a caveat, my, one of the things I will get most that no one ever says directly to me, but to other people, you can't judge him by today's standards because a lot of people are really obsessed with Alice Herlichka for some reason. Um, even while he was doing this, people were opposed to it, in particular, Black people. He could not get Black people around the D.C. area to participate in his studies. The same goes when you were talking about people who supported enslavement. There were always abolitionists, but also the people being stolen from Africa were always opposed to it. By saying we're judging them by today's standards, you were saying that those people or people, and you were agreeing with the status quo that has been set up to make it so our opinions and feelings don't matter. So for anyone who's like, you're being mean to Herlichka, no. <laughs> um, so, the, so also part of my work comes from, um, in, in response to this, how we should think about the biological um, aspects of, of race, um, whether they exist or not, um, is, is how they have been used to create Black people and to oppress Black people. And coming from some Black feminist theorists in particular, so quoted here Gloria Hull and Barbara Smith, saying that the extremity of our oppression has been determined by our very biological identity. And fields like physical anthropology made that biological identity something real. Um, and also uh, this, this notion that we are somehow subhuman. So if you look at all these like hierarchies of humanity that men like Herlichka and those who came before him and after him would construct and how they felt about people of color and black people in particular, um, black folks are always near the bottom and closer to animals and, and non-human <laughs> animals. Um, and so another uh, you know, thought that's often uh, whose work I keep with me, another person's work I keep with me, Sylvia Winter. So she wrote this uh, essay, No Humans Involved, in response to um, basically with this, the use of NHI, No Humans Involved, um, in the Los Angeles Police Department uh, when they were describing the murders of people of color um, and communities deemed non-human. Um, and so after the acquittal of the policeman who beat Rodney King in, in, um, in, in LA, uh, uh, Sylvia Winter wrote this response um, and talked about how the judicial system uh, viewed black people as not people. Sorry. Um, so, Keeping that in mind, as I move towards a couple of the ancestors that I have been working with in these sorts of anthropological museum collections, um, I just want this background where we're thinking about uh, the treatment of these remains, how these folks ended up in these places, and what can be done. Um, so I have a couple examples. So we'll first talk about some of Wyman's trophies, Jeffries Wyman, who was at the um, Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography, Ethnology, which is at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this museum was uh, established in 1877, um, and it is in all its glory. It's still there, still looks just like this, um, and it's full of all sorts of human skeletal remains that we don't know where they came from, no one has bothered to figure out where they came from, etc. Um, and so recently, uh, actually it was only a couple years ago, in the wake of 
Um, Black Lives Matter in particular, Harvard University does sort of this overview of what they have in their collections. And it turns out they have the remains of individuals who were alive during the period of enslavement in the United States. Um, and so the question is, what should we do with the remains of Black people who were enslaved that we have in, in these collections? So they were owned during life and then after death, they are deemed valuable for whatever this vaguely defined science might be. And now they are languishing in the Pavilion Museum. Um, and so this report came out in the fall of 2022. Um, and so for this, I did provenance research and had to write some essays saying it's hard doing this work, emotional labor, et cetera, et cetera, because apparently, uh, again, have to explain to people that Black people are human and have feelings. Um, Shocker. Um, but what I want to point out that I that uh, I really think is great about this report is that it is publicly available and anyone can download it. And there was actually quite a bit of fanfare around it. Um, and my one of the, the biggest points I like to emphasize is that transparency is key. So, so many museums and institutions are hiding their, their skeletons, literally. Um, but you might as well just say what's there. We're not responsible for what our predecessors did necessarily, but what we are going to do to rectify what's been, you know, the, the injustices faced um, by, by the people in the collections and their descendants. So this report being made public is hugely important. Um, so in the collections, there are enslaved or likely to have been enslaved people who arrived at the Peabody from the local area, Boston and Cambridge, but then they came from Richmond, Virginia, St. Louis, Missouri, the Terry Collection, if you're familiar, um, at the Smithsonian now, there's a couple individuals from the Terry Collection at, at the Peabody, um, Louisiana, Delaware, Oklahoma, and Mississippi. Uh, and so basically, you know, just broadly looking at collection records, we're like, okay, these are people who have African heritage who were alive during the time of enslavement in the United States. Um, and basically, the, there's a steering committee is founded because they realize like keeping the remains of enslaved people runs counter to their the fundamental values of the university. If they're claiming that Black lives matter, how can you be owning Black bodies in your collection? Um, so altogether, they've identified 15 people likely from the US and then there are four from Brazil. Um, so what I want to emphasize though, is how can we go about finding, you know, where these people may have come from and who they could potentially be returned to. Um, so a lot of times when we talk about uh, Re repatriating remains. Um, NAGPRA is a huge focus here in the United States. So in 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, which had many loopholes, luckily a few of them are being closed, um, where you could only return the remains uh, from indigenous folks to federally recognized tribes. Um, and there were so many ways people got around doing what was correct in NAGPRA. Um, so a lot of you know, discussions around what to do with the remains of African descended peoples in collections are like, should we have some version of an AGPRA? What would it look like? And one of the biggest issues I come up again, in addition to, which goes right hand in hand with the difficulties of black history in the United States is identify some sort of descendant community. Um, so Michael Blakey at the African burial ground in the early 1990s in New York City really pushed for this use of the concept of a descendant community. Um, people who share like basically a, a similar social status and place with the folks that you were investigating in the past. Um, and the reason it is so important to think about this for black folks in the United States, again, drawing on anthropologist Jovan Scott Lewis, is that Lewis argues that blackness as a relational phenomenon should be seen as a relation of non-relation. Basically, the, because of the history of enslavement and how black folks have been treated and sold in the United States, um, we have migration, removal, dis, dispossession, et cetera. It's very hard to find lineal descendants or exact descendant groups and communities. And so when talking with folks on these committees, especially at Harvard, there would be some people who are like, oh, we should do genetic testing and that's how we'll send everyone back. Genetic testing is not going to tell us about that person's immediate surroundings or who would have cared for them or mourned them um, in life and death. 
uh, that's telling us about their deeper ancestral history. Um, and so it was me trying to explain to them that we should focus more on place, where these individuals may have been taken from, and the contemporary communities that are descendant communities in those areas, whether or not they're you know, related by blood, if you will, does not matter so much as the shared uh, Blackness as a history. Um, and again, I'm just making this plug for this article that just came out, Black Life Beyond Injury, because um, it's, it's brilliant. Um, and it really explains um, the, just, you know, how this history of slavery, of Jim Crow, of everything, um, rends Black relationships um, and continues to do so. So I'm using just a few of the, the individuals who are at the Peabody as an example here, but those who came with Wyman, um, oh, wait. Um, so basically there's, so there's three individuals in the collection who they're just their crania who knew came from Richmond, Virginia. And so starting with the collection records, I was like, okay, well, how did they get here? Who did they come with? Turns out Jeffries Wyman brought these individuals skulls with him when he came back to Harvard, his alma mater after spending a period of time at Hampton Sydney Medical College. It, now this is where Virginia Commonwealth University is uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and basically Wyman is teaching anatomy and this is their first building actually uh, on the campus in Richmond in this like Egyptian style. Um, but basically they're, they're doing dissections here. Um, and this is the, the mid 1800s. And at this time period, the bodies for dissection are largely going to be coming from, stolen from graves. So a lot of black people's bodies being stolen and uh, bodies were also given over from criminals who were executed. Um, and so Jeffries Wyman, when he comes to Harvard, he decided to bring many skulls with him, three that were black people from Richmond who dissected here. Um, and what's really important is that in the 90s, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University was doing construction and they find a well with anatomical discard uh, remains that date to when Wyman was there. And they've already formed a descendant community council um, because many of these remains ended up at the Smithsonian. They're now back at VCU, they're working on memorializing, etc. cetera. Um, this is very important. So let's start with Okay, so in the collection of the Peabody, their skull came with Wyman from Richmond, Virginia, and all it says is like skull of a Negro named Giles who murdered his overseer. Um, after doing some research in historic newspapers, you can actually find the runaway slave ad for Giles, skulls at the Peabody, I want to emphasize this, um, who ran away in April of, um, 1840, 1849, I want to say. Uh, yes, 49, mid 1800. Okay. Um, and he, he ran away after supposedly murdering his overseer for, for no reason. Um, I wonder why a Black person would murder their overseer for no reason. Um, but what I want to point out is uh, the language used in discussing Giles here. So it was a ferocious and unprovoked assault. So this enslaved man who's treated as top property had no reason to have ever attacked the white overseer, um, but also how they describe him. So unusually large and athletic young man, quite black with fine teeth. Um, and this is really uh, typical of runaway slave ads of the day where they would describe physical attributes that someone would be unable to like cover up. So like if he had had a scar or something, they would have likely mentioned it. Um, but what I thought was really interesting is they mentioned his fine teeth because when I saw Giles' cranium in the collection, I was shocked at how perfect his teeth were. Um, and you know, seeing this here was really um, emotional, frankly. So Giles ran away in April and he makes it until at least December um, when he is then unfortunately caught, he's executed in Richmond. Um, 
So he's hung for the murder of his overseer. Um, and again, I want to emphasize the description of, of him. Um, so he's stout, athletic, about 20 years of age, very black, large head and heavy features. His appearance indicating but little intelligence and a sullen disposition. Mind you, this is the mid 1800s and this is the same exact language that we are going to keep using, especially when we start developing methods for racing and ancestry uh, estimation of crania. Um, what I think is really fascinating is that when he's allowed to talk, they mention that he's a fellow of more than ordinary intelligence, like shocking, how he could form complete sentences. Uh, black people can't do that. Um, but they also have to still justify this. So they're saying he has stoic indifference. Um, so it's abundant evidence that he's a proper subject for the gallows. Um, and they mentioned that when he's, you know, he's executed and they put him in this coarse coffin, uh, whatever. Clearly he was not buried though in this coffin uh, because Wyman had his skull. So most likely, again, because this is an execution and early laws provided the bodies of criminals to medical schools, Wyman ends up uh, dissecting him and he kept his skull because it's the skull of a criminal. Um, and uh, going into early like uh, uh, physiognomy um, and, I, and making, you know, linking cranial features to behavior, I mean, this is a perfect example of how, you know, the body of a Black person can be used to argue that biologically um, we are predisposed to certain things like crime. Um, so what's really important is that because this report at Harvard was public. I was contacted by Dr. Daniel Sunshine, who is a postdoc at Virginia Commonwealth University. And when we put together, you know, these various archival traces that we had been, you know, working on completely different parts of the country and no, no communication, um, we figured out how um, right before he moved to uh, back to Harvard, Wyman must have dissected Giles and then brought his skull with him, like not even a month or two later. Um, also in the collections are the skull of, is the skull of another black man who was executed uh, named Moses, and also the remains of a black woman who Wyman didn't bother recording her name. He just says an, an old negress from Richmond, and he kept her because she didn't have any teeth. So he was really interested that he had a completely edentulous person. Um, but again, when when I you know brought this information to the committee. Um, the one way that I, that I was finally able to convince them of this idea of like a descendant community, I was like, arguably the rest of Giles and Moses and this unnamed woman might be in that well that was uncovered at VCU that dates to Wyman's time there. So he only brought the skulls and didn't care about the postcranial skeleton. Um, so hopefully at least three of these individuals will be going back to Richmond eventually. Um, but this is just one way we might go about uh, repatriating ancestor, Black ancestors. I realize I have a slide I don't need. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> so my next case study um, that I've been working on is with the collaborating with the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and so <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Rural Brothers. And I just like to, this image here, um, is there, so the Vero brothers ran a taxidermy studio in Paris in mid 1800s. Um, this is a human that they grave robbed and, and taxidermied. Like, and he was only returned to Botswana in the year 2000, but he was on display in Spain for, for ages. Like they taxidermied a person. So just keep this in mind because it's widely known as we look at lion attacking a dromedary. Um, so basically, <laughs> Lion attacking a dromedary uh, comes from, or is was on museum at, or sorry, on display at the Carnegie Museum. Um, originally, the Vero brothers put this on display at the 1869 Paris Expositions, so like one of these kind of World's Fair type things. Um, it's been called camel driver attack by lions, Arab courier attack by lions, etc. Basically, this individual is supposed to be some generic North African Arab, which we get into the complexities of even defining what that means. 
Um, but basically, they're French guys. They have access to all the colonized areas in, in Africa. They were very well known for sending specimens to museums in Europe. And so with my um, friend and colleague, uh, Maria Fernanda Boza Cuadros, we were kind of retracing places we knew they had been in Africa, because unfortunately, their papers were lost in a shipwreck. Um, but if you go through these, you know, old museum catalogs, you can find, you know, specimens that were donated by the Ferrero brothers and where they got them from in Africa. So we can kind of see where they went around uh, the continent. Um, and so they would taxidermy remains. Here they have what are like, they may be Barbary lions, which are now extinct, um, that are very specific to North Africa and a dromedary, this type of camel that is also specific to Northern Africa. Um, but okay, this is just one fun question. Does anyone see what's like just blaringly, blaringly wrong with this? Like from a perspective of the animals, like the, the lions? <laughs> well, see, it's a male. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> so like, let's just start that. It's a male lion doing the hunting, which does not happen, okay? Um, but basically when this goes on display, um, for kind of this Parisian audience, they're, oh, they're, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> it's so confusing having two of these. Okay, they're, they're trying to, like, basically, they want it to be authentic, even though it was clearly not, um, but also it was so, uh, people really admired it because it showed action, showed movement in a way that, you know, hadn't been done with taxidermy before that. Um, and so basically, you know, people in Paris at this exhibition can get an idea of what these exotic Arabs in North Africa live like. Um, and there's a lot more there we can talk about, but, you know, eventually this diorama makes its way across the Atlantic Ocean. It's at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City for a while. And then it's at the Carnegie where it has been on museum ever since, or on display ever since. Um, but what happens is uh, during 27, in 2017, they're doing some restoration and they do a CT scan and realize that there's a real skull, human skull inside of this diorama. Um, and everyone acted like it was this shocking thing. They're like, well, we knew it had real teeth, but we didn't think there was a whole skull in there. And I'm like, you, you knew they had taxidermied a person prior to this. Like, why would they not have put a skull in there? You think they just pulled someone's teeth out and, you know, whatever. Um, but, so one of the biggest issues too was that the idea that it, there's nothing that can be done. Okay, so like initially a lot of the press around this was like, oh, well, they could have just stolen the skull from the catacombs of Paris. And, you know, as someone who studies the history of using bodies in this way, absolutely not. You don't steal your own ancestors and treat them this way. Also, if they went through all the trouble of getting these uh, Barbary lions and a dromedary, why would you think they would do anything less for the person they're putting on, on the camel would be, would be my argument. Um, so, sorry, I'm just struggling with this. Though. Okay. So part of the way I engaged with this and, and, you know, was in conversation with folks at the museum was, um, you know, they, they figure out there's a skull in line attacking dromedary in 2017, a couple years later, Black Lives Matter. Um, and the museum put out this tweet that said they stood with Black people, etc. cetera. Um, but the museum had this history of not having good retention of, you know, Black employees. And many Black residents of Pittsburgh were like, well, you're saying our lives matter. Why do you still have this very racist, historically inaccurate display of a Black person in the museum? Um, and what's really interesting, too, is that even at the museum, they didn't quite know where to place this diorama. Um, so for a while, it was in, like, the Hall of Mammals or something, but, like, the, the only human figure in the Hall of Mammals was, was the individual on the back of this camel. Then they put it in between the Natural History Museum and the Art Museum, uh, because what is it? Is it real or is it art? Um, is this a good solution? Um, and eventually they, you know, they covered it up so that you wouldn't see it unless you wanted to go in and see it because there was so much pushback. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was this no notion of that we can all be 
looking at this, but see completely different things. Um, like when I saw this, I was like, like what on earth? And yet when they surveyed a lot of their patrons and the visitors to the museum, um, they called it beloved. They thought it was like, you know, part of their, in a way like their local heritage or something, like just something they really associated with the museum and they couldn't see what was wrong with, with having this on display. Um, and so borrowing from uh, Michael Lynch and then also the work of Shannon Novak and Alana Warner-Smith and BioArc use this concept of ontography. Um, and so we're not starting with this assuming a general picture of the world. And basically you're contextual, you're going through the various contexts an object, or in this case, a person's skull is going through um, and how it can mean different things at different times. And so given this history of the treatment of black folks in the United States, I would hope that it's very obvious as to why black people would look at this and look at this um, diorama and say like, this is unacceptable. And an institution cannot be saying they value our lives while putting something like this that is so inaccurate and obviously racist on display, but even worse yet has actual human remains in it. Um, and so fortunately the Carnegie Museum listened to this. And so uh, this is just an image showing like North Africa, French colonization, areas where I suspect this individual may have come from. Um, also an image of the, what, this might be the last Barbary lion that they took a photo of in the wild. Um, and then the, the exhibition as it was. Um, so just, I'm forgetting, I'm losing track of time. A month or so ago, <laughs> I went to the Carnegie. They have taken mine attacking a dromedary off display. And I'm collaborating with Dr. Chris Stantis at the University of Utah to do some isotopic analyses of a couple of the teeth in this individual um, to compare with new data coming out of North Africa to hopefully narrow down where this person may have been taken from based on location. Um, interestingly, you know, the Carnegie for good reason doesn't allow genetic testing. And in this instance, I was like, well, we'd have to be really careful of whose DNA we're comparing this to. Like, I'm not doing one of these like 23andMe collaborations. No, oh, you, you have your ancestor. Like, no. Um, but so we're waiting on these uh, isotope results for lead, uh, oxygen, strontium. Um, and hopefully this, I'm very optimistic that these will track with some of these areas, uh, likely some of the places the French colonized, and we can go from there to see who an appropriate uh, person might be to, who an appropriate group might be that we could potentially return this individual to. Um, and then, oh okay. And then just to conclude, so something else I've been thinking about a lot besides putting, you know, individuals who are already, you know, out of the ground or dissected or what have you in our collections, um, in what instances should we actually be, you know, excavating remains? I mean, as I'm sure any of you who work in collections know, we, we're constantly in our like curation crisis, our collections crisis, all of these things. Um, and Arguably, I'm like, we shouldn't be taking bodies off the ground at all, unless they are at risk. Um, and so the project I am part of in Harlem in New York City um, is this sort of, comes from that sort of history. Um, so basically this image here is the site of, there's a burial ground here underneath all of this in 1903. Um, and it's almost, Oh gosh, actually, you know, I'll tell you the history before I get ahead of myself. Um, so basically, we're, as you can see, it was built upon, but it gets worse than that. So for those of you, if you're not familiar, we are in New York City, the island of Manhattan, um, New York City, um, much of New York State in general claimed by the Dutch starting in 1609 when Henry Hudson goes up the now Hudson River. Um, and they thought that the island of Manhattan in particular was a really valuable strategic location. Um, and at the time it was uh, inhabited by the Lenape people. You'll hear that like myth that they sold Manhattan for like, I don't know, they always give this weird, I can't remember exactly what it is. I should know. That is not true because concepts of land ownership were not the same, but we talk about that later. Um, it was stolen and genocide, et cetera. Um, 
originally the Dutch are on the southern tip of Manhattan, but they planned out a grid for, for all of Manhattan, which is why New York City, for the most part, makes sense, unlike some places I've been, Boston. Um, and so they, they found the colony of New Amsterdam on the tip, and as soon as they arrive, they start bringing enslaved laborers, okay? So the first Africans arrive in 1626. Um, and we know that between 1626 and 1654, at least 464 more slaves are brought to New Amsterdam. Um, and what's really uh, important about the, <laughs> the, the Dutch colony is that it was considered tolerant of diverse religions and ethnicities. However, they still had segregated burying grounds. Um, so this African burial ground, which we have like the, uh, here's where it would be. Um, basically there, there are Dutch folks in the Harlem even before the, the British come and take over New York. Um, and there was a church up here and there was a Negro section of the burying ground and there's a white section of the burying ground. Um, we had, there were both enslaved and free New Yorkers built or buried here from the 1660s up to the mid 1800s. Um, and eventually, uh, even on the site from, oh, I'm sorry. <gasps> okay, sorry. So even on this map from um, 1851, we still have the burial ground uh, labeled. I thought I put a little arrow on it, but clearly I did not. Find, find the burial ground. <laughs> so basically what happens though is that in 1869, the European section of the cemetery is uh, all the burials there are removed from the area. They're reburied elsewhere, but all the people of African descent were left at the site. Um, and eventually there's a casino built on it. Um, and then most recently, Oh my gosh, a bus depot from the MTA, so New York City's uh, Transportation Authority. Um, so this is again putting these historical maps over, and this work was done by um, my colleagues at AKRF. Um, but basically where the cemetery originally was, the bus depot that was built on top of it, this is what it looked like. Um, so basically this bus depot has been decommissioned, and it's in an area of Harlem that's uh, Harlem's historically became a, a very black neighborhood. Um, and because of that, there's all the things that go along with black neighborhoods like disinvestment, poverty, et cetera. Um, so this site, the goal is to redevelop it into affordable housing um, and uh, community space, et cetera. But the, the problem was they knew that there, were, there used to be a cemetery here. Um, so some preliminary work on the site did turn up commingled remains. Um, and then COVID came along and things were put on, on hold for a while. Um, but most recently, we had um, a community listening session um, because it was interesting. There's quite a few uh, black burial grounds around New York City and um, archeologist Elizabeth Mead actually has mapped them out. She has this amazing, um, website called like NYC mapping NYC cemeteries, um, and so the thing is we we know that there's a lot of cemeteries around, but each community might want to handle these differently. So we have you know the African burial ground in the early '90s kinds of paves the way for this community input when it comes to these sorts of sites. Um, but there's for example there's a couple sites in Brooklyn. There's like the Flatbush burial ground, and then there's one in where else it is. But either way there. There were different proposals put forth in these various communities where it was like, do you want us to excavate? Do you want us to leave this alone, et cetera? And different communities had different responses. And so in, in Brooklyn, at a couple of sites, they're avoiding going near the remains at all and doing work that won't disturb them. Initially in Harlem, that was what they were going to do, say that they were going to try to not disturb any remains. Um, but interested community leaders came in and were like, we don't think this is a suitable place for them to be. You might as well excavate them and get them out of the ground so they can be reburied somewhere else where they're not at risk anymore. Um, and so the Harlem African Burial Ground Initiative um, was formed with, you know, local community, interested community leaders. There's also a descendant Dutch reformist church 
in the area that was linked to the original site. Um, so there's also that aspect of descendant community, which I want to emphasize is huge, especially in um, African American contexts. I think that moving forward, a lot of work with churches will be required if we're trying to do right or return remains, et cetera. Um, so we had our town hall. Um, this is currently some of the, like one of the, the ideas for this space that you can like look at. Oh wait, sorry. <sighs> okay. <laughs> um, so basically they're going to have a permanent public outdoor memorial. There's gonna be a cultural education center. Um, housing a minimum of 80% should be, will be income restricted affordable homes. I'm kind of not holding my breath on that one though, if you know housing in New York City. Um, commercial and retail space um, and an area to train East Harlem residents for construction and permanent jobs. And what I wanna emphasize here again is this concept of descendant community. It doesn't matter if the black folks in Harlem right now are directly related to these people by blood. What it matters is that they share the same social status and place as these individuals. It's this form of kinship that in many ways can be, is, is kind of unique to black people in the United States and how we have to be thinking uh, about how we might go about returning remains. Okay. All right, that's all I have because I wanted to make sure we had time to talk. Um, and yeah, so questions, thoughts. Yeah. I have questions. Yes. Um, with the new um, title, the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act, how do you see like? the work you do changing in relation to that, or is it? Oh, so at the AAA, that was just how I organized. So in the federal like spending package, um, the African-American uh, Burial Ground Preservation Act was passed. And all this is, is that $3 million for the next five fiscal years is set aside to be administered by the National Park Service and people can apply for grants to preserve um, African burial grounds, which are all over the country, often at risk. They're forgotten because Black people are in these areas, et cetera. Um, the thing is, the money was like set aside, but it's on the National Park Service to set up like the grant funding or whatever it will be, which as of right now has not happened. There's also a lot of limitations in it. Like as with anything in the United States, it's all about private land. And, you know, it's so it doesn't apply unless, you know, like, person who owns the land, um, wants to participate if it's public land, et cetera. Also, unlike, it's it's a preservation act, okay? Like that's it. And unlike NAGPRA, there's no repatriation or anything. There's nothing about actual <laughs> in it. It's solely about trying to uh, preserve some of these cemeteries, which is a good thing, but it's $3 million a year for five years. Um, which is like, if you look at the entire spending package that was passed, it's like, I, it was a number that I don't even know fraction of a percent <laughs> of, of our budget that's being put towards this. Um, and it's not permanent. So like, it's a good starting point, but there needs to be actual legislation passed. Yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I, I'm really interested in this concept of kinship as politica, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the experience, right? So I'm thinking if you have any thoughts on how this could expand to include other parts of the Americas and the, the Black experience in the Americas and, and throughout the world. Oh, absolutely. So like when we think of this emphasis on like lineal descent and even our ideas of like family are largely like these Western imposed colonial notions of what it should be. And in particular in the United States, what it served to do was to pathologize, you know, black family. Uh, so this is where like in, in the black, I don't know if you're familiar with like these ideas of like the tropes about black women in particular show it. So like the idea of like Jezebels and mammies, and welfare queens, and that black families are inherently dysfunctional uh, 
our fathers don't exist, black fathers are unicorns, um, these sorts of things that there's a long history to destroying family ties and then saying there's something wrong with black people and not society as a whole. Um, and so because of this history and how black people have had to navigate kinship and family, um, we need to expand how we're thinking of, you know, who we should return remains to. And a lot of what I focus on comes from the work of Christina Sharp, a uh, Black feminist theorist who wrote In the Wake. Um, and she talks about mourning. And this also goes along with, um, how do I forget her? Sorry, they have a slider all the time in anthropology. It was worthy of being mourned. Um, but uh, so like, to me, oftentimes it's more about who will value these humans as humans and who will mourn them and care for them when they're dead because black people have historically been prevented from caring for our dead. So we had segregated burial grounds. There were always restrictions on the amount of people who could attend burials and such. Um, there are all sorts of laws to make it so that your status is not being full human in life carried on into the afterlife. And so this idea of like these ruptures and broken relationships, I think is very important uh, because a lot of what Jovan Scott Lewis talks about is repair and how we could go forward and like remedy what has been done. And I think that this wider view of kinship and, you know, family and descendant community is one way working with, skele with human skeletal remains in these museum collections that we can go about re repairing to the best of our ability. But I think this also would apply to, you know, any group that's historically been prevented from, you know, having family, if you will, like having kinship. Um, and a lot of colonized people, I think that would, would fall under that blanket. Um, because it really, by erasing history, you know, it, we erase claims to land. Um, we erase, you know, like this, uh, it kind of denies your right to have a space. So like when, you know, African American black people, like the, the emphasis on being like, you know, I'm a citizen of the United States too, et cetera. Like um, that, that comes out of this just because we've been prevented from preserving our heritage the same way other groups have been able to, um, does not make us, you know, dysfunctional or pathological or something. Um, so yeah, I feel any group that's been subject to, you know, displacement, to, you know, being sold, forced migration, et cetera, anyone could argue that you have these ruptures of relationships. First of all, I really appreciate the presentation and hearing about all the different sort of projects that you have going simultaneously and how they connect, especially in terms of the first couple, because I think when you were mentioning, um, you know, talking about working with organizations, whether it's like Harvard, Peabody, Carnegie, that transparency is key. But at the same time, it's like a lot of those organizations, like their whole reason for being has been the opposite of that historically, like be as elite and insular as possible. Um, and, you know, just worry about the fact that you have endowment money and donations coming in. So I was curious, working on those two projects in particular, do you see that starting to change on the institutional level or is the inertia still there? And right now they're kind of still just working in the wake of Black Lives Matter, hoping for things to go back to the status quo. So I've like discussed this a lot with my other like black colleagues where it's like we often talk about how we have to take advantage of this moment right now because it's not going to last because that's what happens like cyclically. Um, the other thing I found is so the funding plays a huge part of it. So for example, the Carnegie, when they were saying they're taking, you know, lion attacking a dromedary off display, there, there was like someone threatening to pull funding from the museum. And they did take it off display. So I, I was like, you know, if you, I, it's also, I'm like, you know, if you take this off display, you might get new people into the space who will make up for that funding. Um, when it came to like working with the people at Harvard, and I think it goes either way, like, I was like, you know that this in a way could be good publicity. Also, I think it's really important that, you know, if, if we have major institutions like Harvard Peabody, repatriating remains when they legally do not have to, that's setting a really important precedent for other places that might follow suit and be less afraid to admit what they have and also try to repair the damage there. Um, so, I mean, I could see it, I, I, I'm optimistic that it will go well, um, but I know that there, there are still people who are really like 
I mean, one time I was presenting on some of my research and I was actually asked, why should we care what the public thinks of our research? And this was like, oh, they meant it wholeheartedly. Why should we care what the public thinks of our research? And at first I tried to appeal to like, empathy like how would you feel but that didn't work and so then i was like we get public money like as it is I'm just, okay. like it was money then don't we have to answer to the public um and it was more like in that case i was like more specifically referenced by work Smithsonian. like technically if we all own these like we do have to care what the, the public thinks um but yeah that that viewpoint is still really there there's still a lot of like elitism which goes into these spaces there's even like when you look at any museum collection like who has access to them versus who's out there's a lot of gatekeeping um but that i would argue needs to stop but yeah, we'll get there eventually maybe <laughs> yeah so i'm just wondering if you have like thought about or discussed with anyone the concept of of this like you know like chosen kinship or who is really your kin forensically because when I think about it like as someone who focuses a lot on forensics everyone is worried about the legal aspect of family and in reality a lot of oppressed groups do have chosen family and others that they would rather have their remains but may not have like the means to write that down legally in a will or something before they're deceased. And so I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts on that, like from that perspective and how we can integrate chosen family into like repatriating forensic remains. Absolutely. So like something that comes up a lot is um, like, how would you want to be told that like, oh, your enslaved great, great, whatever is, you know, in this museum collection. Some people would never want to know. Um, and it's funny because the way I was thinking of this is when I briefly did forensic work, not far too grossed out with forensic inquiry. <laughs> um, I did, I worked on sifting for remains from September 11th. And that went on for, this was a full decade after, you know, September 11th that we're still sifting uh, debris from the site. And by that time, there was a kind of database of families and people could opt out of receiving notifications, even if you found an identified remains of their loved one. Like they, they, and I thought about that a lot. And then there's also, um, I think I, I can't remember, I think I might have it in, in Decolonized this Collection, the, the essay, and I can't believe I'm forgetting her name, but it's in um, Jasmine Ward's edited volume, The Fire, uh, this time. Um, where this, where, you know, there's this black woman talking about how like her ancestors being enslaved is not like consistent with her view of herself now. And so what I've realized, especially working in museums and doing archival work is that a lot of people self-select to kind of be the stewards of their community and of their heritage. And so those are the people that I think we should reach out to first um, who, could be chosen kin, or like they're selecting themselves to be kin and to care for these remains and have them reburied or whatever it is. Also, if it's based on like, you know, location and such, you know, finding people who have, are interested in that and have been in the community for a while, maybe they'll know something. Maybe they'll recognize a name. Maybe, you know, like I think there's a way to go about this that's a bit more delicate and more focused on like choosing kin and like this concept of mourning that I. It from, from Sharp, um, that's a lot less traumatizing than, you know, I had someone tell me, we were talking, they, they told me they were reached out to by a museum and they were like, we have your grandmother's hair or something like, do you want that? <laughs> and this one of my colleagues, my colleague was like, I don't know what to say to that. Like, can you just, like, should you just cold call people and say, I have my <laughs> pain? <laughs> So I've thought a lot about that, like from the forensic perspective, because forensic anthropologists have to deal with this all the time. Um, and I think there's like a lot there. I'd be happy to know if you have things where you're like, oh, I think you should. Yeah. Just suggest, yes. <laughs> so I think we're about out of time. Um, it's 12.31. Um, the graduate students who are going to lunch, come over here and I'll give you the thing and you can go. Uh, thanks all for coming. And yay.